Excellent. So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Sustainable Sportswear Equipment and Apparel Forum. We're putting on this forum, um, it's been staged by BASIS, which is the British Association for Sustainable Sport, in partnership with the UCA Business School for the Creative Industries, which includes the Centre for Sustainable Design. I'm Chris Whitaker. I'm chair of the management board at BASIS. And for those of you not aware of BASIS, we were founded 10 years ago by uh, Russell Seymour, who's now our chief executive, and he's here today and will be presenting a bit later. And our vision of BASIS really is about harnessing the power of sport to build a sustainable future. We genuinely believe sport can build a better future for us all. And our goal is to empower sport in the UK to be world leading in sustainability that will be driven by the urgency, which is dictated by the evidence that we see around us every day. So educating, sharing and developing best practice, encouraging and facilitating collaboration amongst those interested and concerned about sustainability and sport and influencing through sport which is then acting as an advocate to represent the views of our members to governments and to make sure that we're getting them that message across. So, so those are some of our objectives. And very much staging events like these are part of that conversation with our members. And it's our determination to examine issues like this with them. I do want to thank a few people who have helped us put the forum together today and to make it a gathering of all parts of the industry to take on that challenge, not of why, but how we are going to reduce emissions massively and urgently to achieve net zero as soon as possible. And to do, to do this, we're going to have to line up all the challenges and then tackle them one by one. Today is part of the conversation of asking how. So a thank you to all our speakers. We've got Yassi Dadic, founder of Kahani, Mark Ivar Magnus, Vice President of the World Federation of Sporting Goods Industry, Guido Battaglia, Euro 2020, oh, sorry, <laughs> Head of Policy and Outreach, Center for Sports and Human Rights, and Dr. Russell Seymour, CEO of BASIS. And also my co-organizers, Professor Martin Charter, the director of the Center for Sustainable Design, and Professor it's Philip Powell, so director oh, of the Business School for the Creative Industry. So Sorry, if everybody could mute themselves, please. Thank you. I also want to thank all of you, our delegates, for attending and being prepared to share your knowledge and experience with us later on in the breakout room. And to our researcher, Matthew Weatherfield, and who's done a, an amazing amount of deep diving for us uh, into, into the different products, which we'll discuss a bit more further in the day. And to our event coordinator for today, Anna Beaton, many thanks. Okay, I will see you all during the morning at different times, but um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Please feel free to jump off to refuel uh, at any time. and. Um, I'll now hand over to Professor Philip Powell from the Business School for Creative Industries. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid thanks to a missed train connection, I'm still in transit and whoever said it's better to travel than to arrive, I think was um, not correct today. But uh, welcome everybody. I'm delighted that uh, UCA can be part of this incredibly important mission UCA has a long uh, tradition in the arts and the creative industries, but about three years ago, it decided that it wanted to use the skills that it had developed in creativity, in innovation, and try to help applying those to business practices to start the UK's only business school, which is focused on the creative industries. 
it brings the sorts of issues around creativity and innovation to the fore to try to find new solutions to the major wicked problems that the world faces. And clearly one of those problems is sustainability. So we are delighted to be part of this initiative. And uh, we've had a, a, a presence in the sustainability research area for a number of years through our center, which Martin runs. And we hope we can leverage that more widely through the sorts of partnerships with the organizations represented today. So I will, uh, continue to, uh, to uh, participate uh, mobilely until I, I get to my office. But uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you, Philip. Um, right, so to kick off the day, um, Martin is going to introduce the program and then just talk about the, the flow of, of the morning. Thanks, Martin. Great. Yeah, I'm mute. Classic Zoom moment. Uh, so maybe I'll just first do the technology and see if I can share my screen. Always uh, good to get the technology uh, working uh, first. Um, so great. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Chris uh, and, and Philip. And thanks very much, uh, Chris, for this very good uh, collaboration and partnership that we're now in our sort of third iteration of events and looking to the future. So great experience and looking forward to doing more, more things into the future. So, uh, so essentially uh, we have a number of presentations to start off with. Uh, so I'm gonna give a bit of an overview of issues, uh, particularly related to cricket equipment, apparel and, uh, uh, and clothing. We're not focusing on venues today. That's another issue. If people are interested in issues around venues, Basis does have a, an interest in that area, but we're focusing on the sort of, let's call it the product issues and supply chain issues. So, so I'm going to give a bit of an, an overview. Then we're going to have Mike Ar Iver, who will talk about their experience from the uh, uh, World Sporting Goods Federation, particularly bringing out their experience of looking at these sorts of issues in football. And then Guido uh, will be then exploring some of the issues, uh, 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 you know, social issues, particularly around supply chain. We'll then have a short panel and then we'll move into uh, a breakouts for further discussion. Um, and and uh, then there'll be a short report back and discussion and then we'll close by one o'clock latest. Uh, uh, and we'll, we'll be flexible, you know, if. Uh, we may close a bit earlier, you know, but it's a hard, a hard line at one o'clock. So anyway, so I think without further ado, um, let's get into the meat of it. And uh, so what I'm going to present a little bit is uh, an overview of issues, as I mentioned. And, uh, uh, and, and the other thing that I should mention, I think, is that please, as, as things crop up, please post questions or thoughts into the chat box. And one of our colleagues, Anna, will be monitoring that, that we can bring in at the panel discussion or later on at the discussion stage. So don't be frightened or nervous of putting anything in the chat box. Please just, you know, issues, uh, you know, crop up, you know, uh, thoughts, questions, please put them in there. So uh, cricket equipment, uh, clothing and apparel, in our you know, initial research into this area, we, we're probably starting to feel it's probably one of the most, um, let's say, uh, you know, gear intensive sports. You know, to play that game, uh, play the game, you know, there is a lot of equipment that you need um, or, or you have the option to, to need. So we reckon there's about 40 combinations and permutations of, of uh, 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 equipment apparel that you might use. These are the variations on this, but it is, is a, there's a lot, of, a lot of equipment once you start to, as we did, you know, try and break it all down. And from a sustainability, so, so basically, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it's a big, in terms of equipment use and units used in the game from village to test, there's probably a lot more kit or units sold and used than you, you perhaps would think. 
Um, so from a sustainability perspective, um, it's quite useful to frame this in terms of the sustainable development goals. We have the 17 sustainable development goals that were part of a recalibration of the sustainable development agenda by the UN in, in uh, December 2015. And this is a useful uh, framework to start to look at how sustainability issues might impact on cricket equipment. So the 17 goals are split into environmental, uh, social and economic, and we can sort of start to think about, you know, how those impact on different types of equipment. And just some work that myself and, and Yashi, who's on the call, did, we started to try and break down, and this is really a first cut, some of the key issues, you know, that might relate to the different goals. So, you know, just for, a, for the purposes of this of presentation, I'll just take, you know, a pair of trousers, you know, that we, male or female will wear in the game. Um, and, and sort of what are some of the environmental issues? Well, typically when we look at the SDG around water, we've got issues in the supply chain to do with dyes, uh, chemicals, potential water pollution. We've got issues with clothing at the end of life in terms of landfill, uh, in, in sort of city community areas, uh, in urban areas. Um, We've got issues around, uh, in terms of consumption and production issues around not just the buying of the products, but reuse, uh, you know, materials, recycling of clothing at the end of, uh, of, of life. We've got the whole uh, emissions associated with manufacturing the clothing, but also those in, that embedded carbon as it's transport, transported around the world to be used, uh, you know, uh, wherever the game is played. We've also, you know, to do with typically uh, polyester trousers and, and other polymeric based uh, clothing. We've got is growing issues around microplastics and uh, various changes that are happening there. If we look at the social side, you know, what we are finding is a lot of the manufacturing is in South uh, and Southeast Asia. And, and there, there are issues there, you know, that um, have not really been explored in terms of how production happens. Uh, you know, are, are the people, you know, workers, do they receive health insurance? You know, are there, you know, a lot of particularly in the, in the clothing uh, manufacturing side will be uh, women, you know, issues to do with equality, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And again, if we think about the economic part, a lot of the um, sector manufacturing is outside the UK, you know, in, in India, Pakistan, and, and even wider. So there are issues there in terms of pay, you know, pay, uh, you know, work practices, et cetera, and, and just, you know, the issues around how the factories operate, for example. So that's the sort of frame. So even just booking out trousers there, we can start to pick up there's, there's a, a set of issues that we wouldn't have necessarily uh, thought about. And, and Russ will be talking about this later, but this is a, an excellent uh, in-depth piece of research with uh, a number of scientists that basis completed looking at the impact of climate change on cricket. And I won't go into any detail other than say one of the, uh, the findings and, and uh, speculations into the future. If we do continue to see growing temperature rises, particularly in the, in the global south, you know, uh, there's going to have to redesign helmets and clothing to increase ventilation because people just may collapse. You, you know, if you're going to play the game, you've got to be ventilated in that sense. So, you know, there's some very practical issues associated with, from the high level down to very practical, you know, uh, points. Uh, and particularly also, you know, um, you know on, a, on a very pragmatic level, bamboo fibres absorb sweat. So there's some very pragmatic detail points there. So some of the uh, so if we, you know, start to look at alternative fibres for clothing, you know, that's, and, you know, uh, and, and sorry, it's actually not bamboo fibre. They, they may absorb, be able to absorb sweat, but the, the fibre that actually is very, uh, there's probably a scientific name for this, sweat absorbent, is, is actual fibres from coffee grounds. And there are coffee fibres being produced from coffee grounds in uh, in a company called Syntex in Taiwan, for example. 
So some of the issues, if we're you know even stepping away from climate change and circular economy, is the aptitude, the, the appetite of the sector for innovation. We have seen innovation in the sector, and we're at a particular uh, point in time where next week we have the launch of the 100 in one shape or another, and the ECB is very committed to this. Uh, so this is a very you know we're slightly tearing the rule book up as we did with we am sort of pejoratively we you know 2003 2004 with with 2020 so there's another sort of phase of, of change coming to the sector we've also got you know uh, uh, you know as an ex sort of player at, at sort of league cricket level now retired uh, I, I haven't bought a bat for a long time but I was shocked to see the costs you know of of, of bats maybe up to like four or five hundred pounds so for Access and social inclusivity. There's an issue about you know price of, of equipment and gear. Uh, there's also in terms of anything to do with the kit. You know the first thing is it a performance. It has to perform. You know, and we'll come on. We'll touch on a number of those those issues. And also there's this sort of balance between the tradition in the game and the innovation. You know, and that ongoing battle. Uh, you know, uh, between Test cricket and uh, let's call it 20, uh, T5. So, <laughs> so we're going to have, you know, this, uh, you know, challenges going on. And already we're seeing that tradition impacted. This is a couple of studies by the Heritage Craft Association that effectively say that uh, hand-stitched cricket balls are extinct in the UK. There is no longer any production of hand-stitched cricket balls in the UK. There, we believe there's some finishing, uh, but uh, there is no production of hand-stitched cricket balls. Um, also, in terms of bats, this organization reviews what they term craft-based products every year or two, and they evaluate them. And they're saying that you know, cricket bat manufacturing in, in the UK is on the endangered, the endangered list, 10 to 20 manufacturers left in the UK. But what we, we also have is that split between the very small bespoke producers of cricket bats. We've got the sort of medium sized producers, the Grace Nichols, the Cookaburras, et cetera, et cetera. And then the movement of the transnationals into the sector, the Pumas, the, uh, the Adidas, the Nike. So, you know, so in terms of that UK base, um, and there are problems there with, with skills in the bat making. I spoke to uh, one of the, uh, um, Hunts cricket bats. I had a very excellent conversation there, but the guy said himself, he's 72 or something. And, and I said, could you join the webinar? And he said, sorry, I don't really know what a webinar is. And I said, could you get somebody younger in your, uh, your organization to, to join? And he said, the next youngest person is 68. So we've got issues to do with the skills of making the equipment and, you know, if we're not careful, some of those skills may die out. So there's a broader issue here, strategic issue, about what we could do in UK to retain and develop the cricket equipment sector. And what, what we, we see also is new technology coming in. So on the one hand, we've got very, you know, um, technologies and skills going back into the sort of 17th, 18th you know, century. But now we've got new technologies moving in. This is a product that Anil Kumbli has developed that is using center and AI technology to monitor performance. And so that's performance of the player, but also it's broader in terms of the wider audience in terms of stats and stuff. So you've got new technology moving in. You know, the, the international guys have that, you know, the, the pedal, well, I don't really have this strapped to their back. Uh, monitoring their the, the mileage they do, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we've got this tradition versus innovation again, tradition versus innovation. And what could we do in the UK as well to, to re, re, you, know, you know, build or retain a sector, particularly thinking about circularity as well, and I'll come back to that. So, of course, you know, the game is governed by the laws of the game, the laws of cricket, and, and essentially that are, that are, that are um, you know, uh, uh, managed by the, the, the relevant committee within the MCC. And the most relevant uh, laws, um, 
that affects equipment that we have seen, uh, particularly our law four on the ball and law five on the bat. Um, and those laws have been tested over the years in terms of innovation that has happened. But also it, it's starting to think about, you know, the framework that the equipment sits within, you know, uh, wearing various other hats, I'm quite involved in standardization stuff. So we found, you know, here there's the law for the game, which specifies the, you know, the, the weight and, and, and circumference, et cetera, of the cricket ball. But also, there, I, I wasn't aware of this, there's a British standard for the making of cricket balls. Um, and um, what is still, as we get into this sector, that really has not been researched in great detail, we have found. There's a lot of research in performance, community benefits of cricket, but in terms of the depth on the products, you know, sustainability, my, my, very little. Uh, so we're undertaking research. In this. So I assume that there is still cricket ball manufacturing of some form in the UK, obviously not hand-stitched cricket balls, but we've got all these different variations of, of the products and equipment used in the sector. And, and, and that's another thing we're interested to find out what still is, what elements of the sector is still in the UK and what, what it isn't. In cricket bats, there is no British standards on cricket bats. It, it, this is what we found quite surprisingly, um, that, that, that others may have uh, other uh, more information on this, but uh, there is some law five that specify, you know, the width, the width depth, and indeed, um, I think there's, I've picked up also subsequent to this, there's been a change uh, where um, some of the, I think the depth of the bat uh, can only be, a, has been a certain length because of the, the growth of the big bats. And, and I didn't know this. I know the umpires in the, in the international games had a ball, uh, you know, think they placed the ball through, but they also supposed to have a, a thing they put the bat through now <laughs> if they see a big bat, apparently, uh, you know, uh, so, and, and you typically have a weighting of bats, and I, those change over the years. You get trends and issues around that movement to the, you know, the heavy bat back to the light back, and, you know, different at a, at a sort of professional level, you know, what suits. But it was also, I guess, one of the key things that's become quite relevant recently is that in 1979, with uh, the use of the aluminium cricket bat, uh, Comco, that, uh, that uh, Dennis Lilly, Famously uh, brought onto the uh, into a, 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 it was a test. I think it was a test in England Australia test match. Uh, the laws of the game were changed to specify that that cricket bats could only be made out of wood. And I'll come back into why that's sort of interesting as well. There are the, what we've also found is there's there's our British standards around head protectors, uh, face protectors. Uh, so there's a lot of more of, you know. In thinking about it, you not should be one should be surprised about it. The standards are really around the the protective equipment, so boxes, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This, so that's where there's there's more of a a, a number of um, standards. But there's also some sort of perverse, uh, let's call it, uh, codes and and, and 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 laws that are still um, a little bit unclear. Great Grace Nichols did a lot of innovation to produce uh, a, a series of products and gloves and I believe other equipment using recycled and upcycled materials. And Sam Billings used this in a, in a 2020 game uh, uh, in, in New Zealand and uh, effectively due to some sort of obscure color rated regulation to do with broadcasting uh, to do with the, the, the number of colors that can, can be, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, visualized in equipment, uh, the, those gloves, those gloves uh, and the other equipment had to be withdrawn. So Grace Nichols, as far as we understood, did a lot of innovation around thinking about, you know, upcycled gloves. So this, the offcuts were essentially, as it says, they were offcuts from the manufacturing process. They reutilized that production of cuts into gloves and other, but effectively it was banned. So there's a sort of slightly perverse um, restriction to, let's call it sustainable innovation. So in terms of cricket bats, you know, 
you know, still the predominant material is, is English willow. Uh, and uh, which is grown, and I, I see, uh, if I get this wrong, Jeremy, please correct me in the chat, privately still grown where it's grown in the UK and the Southeast, but uh, from very helpful information that Jeremy provided me, there are there is willow grown in, in Europe along the Danube, uh, in, in, in Romania, uh, but also there is a Kashmir, is Kashmiri willow um, in India, and I picked up there is some plantations of willow in, in states, a few states in Australia that were actually initiated by Slagenbrook some time ago. So there are pockets of, of, of willow out there that are, that are used. But it, you know, like any natural material, it's subject to you know, the natural laws and climate change, you know, um, and, and there isn't a finite supply you know, of, 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 of the wood, essentially. And of course, those, uh, the wood goes into the bats, of which there are you know, multiple varieties if you're including the transnationals and, and, uh, and uh, you know, most, you know, uh, you know, a significant proportion of those bats, if you're thinking of the global market are out based on outsourced production, but there's still you know, a heavy craft-based industry there you know, with a lot of skills in making the bats and a lot of uh, professionals and semi you know, professionals will, you know, they'll go and talk to their bat maker, you know, you know, get the right weight, the right feel. So there's that also that relationship there. And over the years, you know, there's been various innovations, uh, you know, where bat manufacturers have, have, have sort of played around with the sort of mass of the, the bat with the scoop. I always fondly remember age 17 getting a, getting a scoop as a Christmas bat as a Christmas present, which I remember that as a great uh, moment to get that. And then, uh, so taking, you know, material out of the back of the bat, you know, redistributing it, then you had, um, you know, uh, the jumbo and the turbo, again, where they, you know, uh, uh, Stuart Surridge redistributed the material. Uh, and then with the advent of 2020, um, I'm just picking out a couple of the innovations. So you've got shoulderless bats, all sorts of other things. But in the advent of um, 2020, there were reverse of innovations, you know, the mongoose bat and, and a couple of others that, again, still, uh, you know, fulfilled, you know, were, were within the laws of the game, but, you know, look very different, but seem to sort of disappear fair, fairly quickly. But here, that, this picture, I think, is, shows really quite from Barry, I think that's Barry Richards, uh, ex -South, Af South Africa and Hampshire. Uh, and uh, yeah, and um, anyway, uh, so just showing the difference of the big bats, the, da uh, the, the David Warner bat compared to the old style, uh, you know, bats, you know, just the amount of wood light pressing with a bat. Um, and where in the past, maybe a lot of it, uh, you know, people would keep their bat going for a long time. You know, a lot of the pros, they, they, only, they only have a finite number of, um, lives associated with the product before it back before it breaks but as i said we've had innovations new materials used uh, like the attempt to use aluminium you know the plastic or polymers are being used in various uh, bats for for kids cricket for quick cricket and uh, ecb have been heavily involved in, in the whole area of get taking the um, the game out to kids and also very recently we've had the uh, Darcel, who is on the call, uh, and, and his colleagues at Cambridge have developed the bamboo cricket bat uh, that used uh, one, uh, uh, you know, type of, of the many types of bamboo out there to produce a prototype that's got a significant amount of, of interest. And as we understand it, um, one of the issues there was that within the laws of the game, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have, uh, you know, that bats could only be made of wood and bamboo is a grass. So there is, you know, discussion going on around um, the materials. It's sparking another conversation. Um, so and just to illustrate, you know, just the reality of the global supply chain here, this is a guy called Joe Sillett. Uh, uh, who in the early 2000s developed the Woodworm Cricket brand. And, and I was there in a game where he scored his century at Brook Cricket Club in Surrey 
where he had a bat that had woodworm in, and uh, he got his hundred, and his uh, uh, his father had just uh, got a payout pension fund, and he set up a company with the woodworm cricket brand that then Peter Cern and Flintoff used, and it grew quite significantly. But even him as a small company in Sussex, he outsourced his production to Indonesia, to Taiwan, to India, and uh, uh, and and China even. So he was outsourcing and not producing in the UK, mainly because of the labour costs. And what we're seeing is some, you know, elements to do with um, the sort of perverse aspects of supply chains where, you know, parts of the items of bats and balls are sent to India to be produced and then they're sent back to the UK to be finished. And there seems to be some evidence that materials are also can also be shipped out to parts of, uh, you know, to India and then where they're assembled because of lower labor costs and then shipped back. So there is, there's definitely issues to do with global supply chains there. And also what we found is that there's actually, you know, perhaps more of a unrecognized sector around uh, the whole repair and refurbishment of cricket bats. And, uh, Going online and doing the research for, for this project, there is now quite a significant number of videos showing you how to repair your bats. And even um, a, a very interesting sort of like, I mean, I think it's about three, four years old, a company called Fantail in, uh, in New Zealand, who effectively um, are, they, they, they produce customized bats, but also they have a repair service. Uh, which they charge various types of repair. And also they've got a refurbished bat, fully refurbished bat, which they call a revamped bat. But also interestingly with this company, they have sort of very high quality videos showing you how to do this, but they're acknowledging sustainability in their mission statement. Based in New Zealand, they want to have a positive impact as a lot of the millennials do. They want a good business, but sustainability is the heart of it. So they're also recognizing and, and, and looking for new solutions with new sorts of materials, recycled materials, et cetera. Clothing and apparel. Um, so again, a lot of, you know, a lot of, if, if you look at a game, one game, it could be, a, you know, maybe over a hundred items of clothing. Used. So the, you start to stack the numbers up. This is quite a significant industry. And, um, you know, uh, what we, we have, is uh, a lot of outsourced manufacturing. We've got issues maybe to do with wages, you know, how, you know, what is paid in the supply chain, working conditions, factories, health, you know, uh, worker safety, diversity, as we mentioned earlier. And again, a classic polyester uh, trousers, it isn't just those issues in production. We've got these wider issues, you know, uh, if, you, if you're washing your, your trousers, that can be producing microplastics, which is becoming a, a broader issue. So there is a sort of these obscure almost links there. But what we seem starting to see, for example, in other areas is the emergence of the use of, of other sorts of fibers. And so we've got a company uh, called Pinatex who's producing fibers from pineapple. We've got another company called Banana Tech using fibers from, uh, uh, from, uh, from banana. And then bamboo fibers. Um, and uh, indeed, Warwickshire last year uh, launched a new range where they were using uh, uh, shirts that incorporated bamboo fibers. I mean, there may be other examples out there and, and we'd be really interested to hear about that. You know, if, if people do have thoughts and ideas, please just send those on, on to us because we're just trying to collect what's going on at the moment. But also you have other types of fibers that could be used. So this is a fiber that's being uh, used. That's a second life fiber, nylon fiber, that is from waste fishing nets. And it's, it's the waste fishing nylon nets are de and repolymerized and then produced into a second life fiber that's been used in clothing. And I just Googled there, there are examples of caps, for example, for other sectors that are using the ethanol fiber. We've also got the emergence of, um, you know, in this, what I would I term this fourth green consumer way uh, of, of the emergence of vegan leathers. And this was just, you know, lab stuff a couple of years ago, but now it's starting to be commercialized. 
pluses and minuses with these vegan leathers in the sense, you know, they're, you know, and, and also there are a number of high profile vegans in cricket, you know, uh, is that yes, they're not using animal hides, but they're still using a, a polymer as a binder. So there are still, you know, uh, issues there. But the interesting point now, Nike have just launched with Pinatex a vegan leather uh, shoe just a few years ago, or sorry, a few weeks ago even. So this is, you know, things are bubbling up, new innovations are bubbling up that maybe this sector could, you know, is, is you know, it, it's worth considering. So going forward, you know, um, you know, maybe we need to start to think about, you know, how we move from the sort of linear approach with the cricket, cricket equipment where, you know, it's sourced, it's processed, it's used, it ends up in landfill, um, to a more circular approach. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, whether, and there are approaches to do this, to start to think through, how, you know, choice of materials, designing for repairability, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll be looking to explore this in another workshop in October and November. So if anybody wants to be interested in attending that, please let us know and we'll, we'll add you to the list. So just uh, um, in, in moving towards the end, my colleague uh, Matt, uh, Matt will, uh, will just give a little bit more detail quickly on, on uh, a little bit more research we found on um, bats and bulls. So, Matt, over to you, and I will move your slide. So please just tell me to move, move slide or whatever. That was great. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, first of all, I must apologise for the less than stellar image you're getting on the end of this. My, I had my laptop fully up, and then my Zoom suddenly decided it didn't want to work anymore. So I've quickly put it up on my phone, and we'll go from there. So um, firstly, what I've been doing with Martin is I've been going through a list of the different types of cricket equipment and looking at not only the material composition involved with them and sustainability issues around that, but then also the potential pathways for innovation of how can we improve on the current materials that are being used and are the present alternatives appropriate enough. So if we go on to the first slide proper, then we look at cricket balls and there are two key parts to cricket balls as many of you will probably know you've got the core and you've got the casing now they've been chosen because of their ductile properties so for the core it's from made from compressed um cork bark and that's because it maintains its shape well and it's a really quite good material to absorb any of the pressure that balls will face it's the same thing with the yarn really and so you see the habit of these lightweight materials that have been chosen for the purpose because there's both strong and lightweight and that's something that we will be looking for in um, substitute materials so that's what we want to try and do find the keep maintain the best parts of original materials that are being used and find the most appropriate alternatives now alongside for the casing you have the yarn quilted inside leather which is which is which is made from animal hide and it's with proteins bind it's tanned with proteins and aluminium salts to give it durability and that's key to a lot of these processes so that they're hardy enough to be used over and over and have that sort of durability that is needed in professional sports if we go to the next slide then we can see potential pathways for innovation now the key concerns over the leather is more um, sort of social sustainability and moral issues over that and concerns over use of animal hides. Now, in terms of wider sustainability, obviously, um, animal farming is has its um, environmental drawbacks due by sort of um, the CO2 emissions from farming processes. However, obviously, the level would be uh, almost side product of that but there have been many advancements in vegan leather such that martin um extended on already such as um alternatives from pineapple leaves and cactus leaves and that's shown that there really is an alternative that can be both sustainable and keep in touch with sort of um moving 
moral feelings towards animal products. Now, in terms of the cork, whilst cork is a really good product to, to be using, there are this, even though it is a sustainable product in itself, as it absorbs um, up to three times more CO2 once the bark has been harvested. So it's actually more sustainable as a result of um, cricket ball manufacture. Its main drawbacks in terms of sustainability come from supply side issues and the fact that it takes nearly 30 years for it to mature ready for harvesting. And you could have a, and alternatives like bamboo fibres have been suggested as a quicker growing alternative that could be equally durable. And if you increase supply, then you can make sure that then you can make sure that you increase that you meet up with current demand and you are more able. It's better for supply, if I just put it like that. If we go on to the next slide, with cricket bats, we could You've got the um, the main cleft made from um, cricket bat willow, and these this faces similar issues to um, cork in a way, as there are supply side issues, especially due to the fact it takes fifteen years for the trees to mature, and twenty five percent of the harvest is generally unusable. And bamboo has been suggested as an alternative that could be more appropriate for developing cricket nations such as China because it matures within a third of the time. It allows for multiple harvests over one cycle and it's a generally cheaper material that is also more absorbent of carbon. You also have sugarcane which comes from um, Malaysia and from Indonesia and that is used in the handle whether it's spliced with rubber for shock absor absorbance. If we go on to the final slide then we sort of are confronted with one of the main innovations that Martin has really been talking about, which is the potential for a bamboo bat. Now, a prototype has been developed by researchers at the University of Cambridge, and it's using for the for the main cleft of the bat laminated bamboo, which is a product which has which maintains the 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 performance qualities of willow whilst having improved sustainability features. It's not only got a quicker manufacturing process and is as strong, but it's also got improved performance capabilities such as a larger sweet spot, which means shots could be up to say 20% bouncier. And that's a really key thing we want to look at continuing this research. How can we combine both sustainability and innovation to improve the performance of the sport as a whole because there will be many issues around tradition and around performance in terms of how sustainability may affect sport and worries that you're trying to cram it in there but if you can show that you can actually make it so that the sport is more exciting and that it goes hand in hand with performance and the next level advancement we would see anyway then I think that's a really key way and key line on which innovation can be pursued. Now, simply the, one of the main steps for this pathway of innovation to continue is weight reduction, as it is a heavier bat, 40% at the moment, but it is only a prototype and it just gives us a key direction for where such innovation needs to go next. And it shows that with bamboo being identified as a key product, and a more sustainable alternative, it shows that there's really a lot that can be done and we will be continuing this analysis alongside of the full range of cricket clothing as well. And we hope to have those results shortly. Thank you very much. So, so thank you very much, Matt. I mean, sorry, we're running a little bit over, but Matt, Matt's been doing this excellent research and we thought we'd find a space to put this in the, the session. So. Just, just to clarify very briefly before I close, there's, I mean, we, we're looking at being a platform for innovation. We're not looking at producing stuff ourselves. So we're looking at supporting stakeholders in the sector where we can, whatever knowledge we have and connections to look at innovation in terms of sustainability. So 
that that's and, and we'll be announcing uh, later on in the year some ideas that we, we have around that that area so so clearly it's an interesting point in time um with the pandemic you know how things have changed the ongoing discussion over test crickets you know uh you know not just the the blast in the uk and the other tournaments the ipl but also the sort of uh uh, the issue about bringing in new audiences, making the game, you know, uh, you know, relevant. Um, so uh, one area that that we are contemplating and thinking about, and have had some interest, at least at a conceptual level, is why don't we make the sustain uh, the hundred in twenty twenty sustainable, and and what would that even be? So um, so we're just leaving that as a thought, um, and I will. Shut up now, and I will pass back to Chris. Thank you, Martin, and thank you to Matthew. That was um, a really great way to frame probably the, the conversation for the rest of the day. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Russell Seymour, who, as I said, is the chief executive of Basis, um, and he's going to have a look at climate change and cricket gear. Russell? Yep, yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. I'll just share my screen. Uh, so I'm going to try and do a, a whiz through lots of issues around uh, primarily climate change, but a couple of other sustainability issues that's, that's linked to cricket gear, clothing and apparel. So very quick introduction to basis. Um, I'll give a quick look at a definition of sustainability, sustainability cricket. Equipment and clothing regulations, Martin's already covered those a little bit, but I'll, I'll talk a wee bit more on that. Some recommendations, and I've also been asked to talk about Sport 2050, which some of you may have seen the BBC did a series on their BBC Sport website around what sport might look like in 2050. So I just pulled some of the points from the cricket story that was there um, that I think is relevant to us. So very briefly, basis, our, our position is that sport happens and it will continue to happen. And although sport has an impact on the environment, we're also impacted by the environment and environmental change and, and all of these sustainability issues that we've talked about. But in general, sport is positive, all the social benefits, all the economic benefits that it brings. So the position that we take as basis is that we just need to find a position where we can balance any negative environmental impacts against all of the positive impacts that we can have. So essentially, we're managing the sport that is already happening. We're not necessarily about using sport as a platform to, to talk about or promote sustainability issues, although we do that as part of the, the discussion of the, the way we manage things. Um, but we just want to make sure or, or try to assist sport in being much more sustainable because sport can can actually talk about these issues in a, in a trusted way you know there's no political agenda around sport doing this we do webinars we do conferences etc but we also produce reports and you've already seen martin pulled up the image of hip six um, but the game changer report was produced back in 2018 talking about sports more generally the impact of climate change hit for six talks specifically about cricket but just a few weeks ago we published rings of fire which is looking at how heat um, could be could impact uh, athletes at the tokyo olympics a quick definition of sustainability if you if you google for a definition of sustainability you'll find this one that's that's close to the top there our Common Future was a document that was produced uh, back in the 80s, I think it was 87, it was it was published. It's also known as the Brundtland Report. Uh, the ex-Norwegian pr uh, Prime Minister wrote the report, um, Gro Harland Brundtland. And it's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Many of you will have seen this definition before. Um, there's something intuitive about it, 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 it kind of makes sense, but I would argue that if you look at it in a bit more detail, you, you can question a few elements of it. Um, you know, who defines what needs are? The needs of somebody in North America or Western Europe is probably very different to somebody uh, in Southern Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So, so there are debates and discussions, but intuitively, we kind of get what it means. You understand what it means. Um, and it develops these three concepts of environmental protection, social equality and economic growth. Now, I would prefer the language that's in at the bottom there. Um, I feel that the protection, equality and growth actually implies something controlling. It's very political, very controlling. Um, and it's a way of 
really strongly managing was my preferred language was actually from a former British standard, which is no longer in use. Um, the revised version of this British standard does use the Brundtland report definition, but it talks about environmental responsibility, acting responsibly towards the environment, social progress. This is positive. It's continuous. It's moving forward. Equality is almost something that you get to a minimum level and you can stop whereas progress is continuous, it keeps us going. And economic activity doesn't necessarily imply continuous growth, which a lot of people talking about sustainability feels isn't sustainable in and of itself. But these three elements come together, I'm sure many of you have seen this image before. When these three come together, you've got a sustainable approach. But for basis, we even find using the term sustainability a little bit difficult. It can have different meanings when you're talking about financial sustainability as opposed to economic sustainability. There are nuances that, that can be tricky and it can be difficult to talk about this to, to people who maybe don't feel they have time, don't have the background, don't have the knowledge to discuss it. So we try and use a thread of health, a simple one hook of health. So this isn't a perfect correlation, but the way we try and talk about these now is to talk about personal health. So the physical and mental health and well-being of the people that come to you, use your products, use your venues. It's community health. This equates roughly to the economic uh, sustainability. This is about your relationships. It's about your supply chains. It's meaningful relationships with your suppliers, with the communities around you, with other stakeholders. And then planetary health is about understanding and minimizing your impacts on natural systems. A little bit of science coming up, I'm not going to do too much detail, but back in 2017, there was a paper published um, called The World Scientist Warning to Humanity, A Second Notice. 25 years previously, a paper which was more theoretical, saying these are problems that might happen in the future, was published so back in 1992. In 2017, they looked at some data from those warnings. So a few graphs, if they'll come up. So... One thing they said was about the ozone hole. Those of you around back in the 80s um, will remember the ozone hole was the biggest problem of the time. Um, something called, the world leaders got together and they, uh, they signed something called the Montreal Protocol, which banned these chemicals that were going up into the ozone layer and destroying the ozone, this protective layer that stops UV light. With this decline of chlorofluorocarbon production, the ozone hole started to recover. So this is a positive and it demonstrates that when politicians get together, they can actually do something, they can actually take action. So this has got a green border around it because it's, it's a positive story. If we look at freshwater resources from the 1960s coming up to the mid 20 teens, that's not a positive story. There's a decline, so a red border. The rest I'm gonna nip through quite quickly now, but it's the colors that are relevant. Green is good, red is bad. So marine catch is declining. Dead zones, these are literally areas of the oceans where, where there is no life, are increasing. Forest cover is reducing. Abundance of, of vertebrate animals reducing significantly. Carbon emissions going up, temperature change increasing, population levels for humans is increasing, as are the, the ruminant livestock that we rely on. So all these trends are going the wrong way. Another paper in 2019 looked at a lot more detail. Do not try and read these. It's just there's, there's too much there. But on the left, we've got some human impacts. On the right, we've got the climate response. Again, it's the colours that's important. So in terms of what people are doing, there are a few things there which are positive. Most of it's going the wrong way. In terms of the climate response, every single measure is going in the wrong direction. So it's pretty undeniable. There are huge impacts to what we're doing to the world and we need to change that. And sport is no different. Every element of society is gonna be impacted and is causing some of these issues. There are different ways of looking at this. This is the model on the right there. Again, don't look in too much detail at it, but this is something called the planetary boundaries model. There's just been a, there's a Netflix documentary and a book has just come out called uh, Breaking Boundaries, which describes some of this in a more popular way rather than the scientific literature. But the ones that are most relevant, I think, to, to cricket gear um, and clothing is probably waste and then climate change. Um, and we've got to find ways to mitigate what we're doing to reduce our impacts now. But we're at a point where, as all of those trends demonstrate, these things are happening already. So we've also got to start to adapt as well. 
I'm just going to use a few examples to show how cricket is currently being impacted by these issues. So the first one I'm going to talk about briefly is, is air quality. Um, and you may hear some talk about things called PM10s and PM2.5s, and it just stands for particulate matter, bits, tiny, tiny bits in the air. So PM10s, things like dust, pollen, and mold. But PM2.5 is combustion particles, um, different compounds in the air. Um, and this just shows the size of them. These are tiny things. And PM2.5 can actually get into the lungs and pass into the bloodstream as well. So these are having significant effects, but we don't know exactly what those longer term effects might be. Uh, this is Delhi, uh, India Gate on a, on a very smoggy, uh, smoggy day. But when you try and play sport in that, in those conditions, um, it becomes difficult. So this was December 2017, uh, India versus Sri Lanka. Um, and in the days before it was trendy to wear, uh, or I should say necessary, not, uh, um, there were actually players on the pitch wearing face masks because the air quality was that bad. Players were being sick on the pitch. Bowlers were only able to bowl two overs at a time before they left the pitch to go onto oxygen to try and recover. Um, there were oxygen cylinders on the side of the pitch up in the changing rooms. So it had a huge impact on, on this match in particular. But if you look at the Game Changer report that I mentioned briefly earlier, the opening line of the section on cricket says, of all the major pitch sports, cricket will be hardest hit by climate change. So what are these impacts actually going to be? I'm sure you'll recognise exactly what this is. Obviously, it's a picture of the earth. Um, but here, uh, this is around the West Indies. So just to the north uh, is, is North America, Central America and Northern South America. And obviously this is the West Indies in, in this general area, you know, a great cricket playing country uh, or group of countries, I should say. Three category five hurricanes passing across that area all at the same time. This was um, uh, 2017. Um, and a fourth one actually came through as well. Hurricane Maria came through later. Um, and had this impact on Windsor Park in Dominica, a test playing ground. Um, so huge damage to the infrastructure. And similarly, similarly in uh, the rugby re most recent Rugby World Cup, Super Typhoon Hagibis came through. Um, three matches were cancelled and bottom right there, you can see the Canadian rugby team who should have been playing a rugby match um, were actually helping with the cleanup operations. But this had impacts for the organisation. Those three matches, there wasn't time to reschedule them and some of them had implications for qualifying rounds. So administrators for sport may have to start looking at weather impacts and putting in more time for matches to be replayed. This is Corbridge Cricket Club up in Northumbria in the north of England. Um, just a lovely summer's afternoon, people out playing cricket. But this is what it looked like after Storm Desmond came through uh, again in 2017 from memory. Um, the club had only recently managed to get enough money to, to, to build these facilities. Um, the ECB stepped in and, and assisted um, and some of the facilities were rebuilt. My understanding, and I know that people from ECB on the call would possibly know better than I, um, my understanding around this time, ECB paid out around a million pounds to assist clubs to recover from this sort of damage. It's doubled that now because this is now becoming uh, more frequent. And it's relevant to cricket because unlike rugby and football, the, the, uh, the spectators that go to watch international cricket matches tend to play as well. So if we don't get people coming in and playing cricket, then maybe it's going to impact later uh, on the people that actually come and watch international cricket. This is Worcestershire on a day when they should have actually been playing cricket. So some even professional clubs, first class grounds are actually being impacted by much more frequent flooding and it has knock on effects for things like insurance, etc. But just people actually able to come and play to recover from this. It isn't just that the water has to go, you then have to uh, address all the issues with the pitch um, and cleaning up. The World Cup in 2019 with the final played at Lords. The first week of the work, uh, Cricket World Cup in 2019, or first or second week, um, saw three match abandonments and one no result match. It was officially the wettest World Cup in, in Cricket World Cup history um, because of that disruption from those matches. Um, but later in the tournament, one match at Lords uh, was played in 34 degree heat. Now that's high for, for England, as we know. In 2016, the Indian Premier League um, 
there'd been a huge drought in India for three, four years. Uh, and yet cricket pitches were still being irrigated. Millions of litres of water were being poured on to, to generate these beautiful green lush pitches. Three clubs were taken to court and the courts ruled you can no longer irrigate your pitch. If you can't irrigate your pitch, you can't play cricket. So in the middle of the season, I think it was 17 matches had to be uh, moved out of state, moved out of the area. Um, so the disruption to the clubs, to the fans, um, to all the logistics that went with it uh, was, was huge. Um, so the biggest cricket league in the world impacted by weather effects, made more common, made more frequent by climate change, made more, more severe by climate change. Um, this is widespread. Um, this is South Africa, Western Province Cr Cricket Association in 2017 cancelled club and school cricket due to drought. The pitches just became too hard. It was too dangerous to play. So cricket was not played for a period, again, because of weather impacts. In 2019, Ireland played their first test match at Lords. Um, one of the days of that match was the hottest day ever recorded in England, 37.8 degrees centigrade. This isn't just an issue for the players because on that day, I was, I was working at Lords at the time, on that day, we more than doubled the number of spectators that had to go for medical treatment because of heat and heat related illness, heat related issues. So there's a duty of care to, to spectators. Uh, Joe Root, this was the test match uh, in Sydney in January 2018. He batted through the whole day. Uh, outside of the ground, temperatures were recorded at 47 degrees centigrade. In the middle, where Joe Root was batting, uh, the on-field peak was 57.6 degrees. 57.6 degrees. He batted the full day, six hours, wearing full pads uh, and that has a huge implication for you not being able to sweat, not being able to release that heat from you. Sweating is your natural way of, of removing heat. So if you can't sweat, you get all these physiological effects. And this comes from uh, the, the Hit for Six report. Um, huge impacts on the body um, going all the way up to heat stroke, which is a medical emergency and you need treatment for. And Joe Root did spend the night in hospital. Apparently he had a, a, a stomach bug as well, but he had to spend the night in hospital uh, after batting. Um, so the major factors that do limit or the impact in terms of heat, the environmental conditions, obviously the temperature, the humidity, um, how intensely you're exercising. And in fact, a, a batsman, a test match batsman can be using as much energy as a marathon runner. Um, it's just used in different ways, sudden bursts of energy uh, for, for running between the wickets, but you use a lot more energy than people realize, but also the clothing warm because the clothing, effectively insulates and it provides a barrier so that heat can't be released. You can't release the sweat, it can't evaporate. Um, but the sweat also goes into the goes into the fabric and it becomes heavier and it sticks to the body. So clothing is important in, in managing issues related to heat. So some of the potential implications, again, these are listed in the Hit for Six report. We could see more games postponed, rearranged uh, to cooler times of day because of safety related heat stress um, and some sports are introducing these heat stress indices you know we may see cricket in the future not just postponed because of rain but postponed because of heat um, quite a, it'd be quite an odd feeling for England if we ever had to postpone due to heat um, but poor performance just you as you get hotter as your body gets hotter your brain just starts to shut down your hand-eye coordination starts to reduce so there could be poorer performance um, maybe that implies things for the spectators as well poor if there are poorer games Decreased motivation to perform. Um, it's not that it's a conscious decision, um, but the body just can't perform in, 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 that, in that high heat. So again, performance related. Um, increased likelihood of heat exhaustion, um, potentially batsmen retiring hurt, and increased likelihood of heat stroke um, requiring medical attention. And climate change really is becoming a massive factor for cricket. Um, it, it has the potential to fundamentally alter the game. And cricket has always changed. All sports always change, they evolve. The way we play cricket now is different to the way we played in the 70s or the 50s or whatever. Um, but climate change is something that is impacting cricket from the outside. So it's something that we have to adapt to. It's not something that there's innovation from within cricket. So it's something that we need to take seriously and look at. In terms of clothing and equipment, um, 
there's nothing in the laws that talks about clothing as such. The laws are about the way you play the game, not what you wear when you play the game. So nothing in the laws as such, but there are clothing and equipment regulations. So the ICC document is, is to the left and the ECB have a similar document effectively translating that for domestic. Primarily, this is about what advertising you can have on there and what color things can be. Um, it doesn't actually necessarily specify particular things about the, the fabrics or or what they should, what fabrics should be used, etc. Um, so there's not a huge amount of guidance in there, but it only ever talks about trousers, for example. It never talks about being allowed to wear shorts. Um, so, and as Martin's already alluded to, there are there's a series of British standards around protective equipment. Um, so I won't go into that in, in too much detail. The recommendations due to climate change, again, these come from the, the Hit for Six report, adjusting regulations to allow players to wear shorts, for example, there may be other reasons why shorts may not be appropriate, but for example, shorts um, or other non-standard clothing uh, to increase cooling, the ability to, to evaporate the sweat, um, and review of fabrics to enhance evaporation and cooling, wicking sweat away, etc. Um, and then equipment Manufacturers should accelerate testing of helmets, gloves, pads that will enhance airflow to help reduce the, the major impact, which is going to be heat. Just briefly to talk about the Sport 2050, um, and worth taking a look if you've not seen this, but just Google BBC Sport 2050, and there's a whole series of, of imagined stories. Is it totally imagined? This is not a, a prediction of what we think is going to happen. I was one of the so-called experts that actually was on a panel to talk about these uh, these different stories. Um, so completely imagined, but grounded in what we think could happen. So the one about cricket was the extreme heat and air pollution from wildfires that forced cricket indoors. So the story came from the first test match played in the Dome of Cricket in Melbourne. There were lots of points made in, in the story about what could happen, what the implications were, um, but the relevant issues and possible future solutions include it was suggested that test matches would be played across six days because there would be more and longer intervals with shorter playing sessions to to counter the impact of heat um, it was suggested that cricket should be made a winter sport in australia rather than a summer sport again uh, to, to combat the heat um, the pitches don't respond when they're indoors so the the game was being fundamentally changed and people didn't like that neither players nor the nor the spectators um, and it suggested that cricket was having this massive boost in scandinavian countries because suddenly the 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 weather was conducive to playing cricket but far fewer people were playing where it's now really hot in australia and india so these imagined scenarios are kind of trying to suppose what might happen in the future should climate change continue so just a couple of slides with some conclusions from me. Sustainability issues, but climate change in particular could have, and almost certainly will have with the current predictions, will have significant impacts on the game of cricket and not just in terms of what we manufacture, but actually the way the game is played. An extreme heat can have profound effects on player safety in particular. So changes to clothing and equipment can really help to mitigate uh, those impacts. And then solid waste and, and liquid and gaseous emissions contribute to these current impacts. So we've got to minimise the amount of waste that we produce through proper processes management. And then look at our supply chains. Um, some of these social issues got to be mitigated through looking at our, our supply chains as well. A very quick whiz through some of the issues and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about some more uh, later as well. But thanks, back to Chris. Thank you, Russell. Um, as you're probably all aware, we're running slightly over time, but um, don't worry, we, we'll catch it up um, in either the panel discussions or the breakout rooms. Um, so thanks, Russ. I thought that very much underlined the why part of uh, what, we, what I spoke about earlier. Um, absolutely makes it imperative that we look at you know, how we change now. So um, next speaker is... Um, is Mark Ivar Magnus, who's the Vice President uh, for the World Sports Sporting Goods Federation industry. Um, and he, he's going to talk about the, the pledge that uh, he's working on with FIFA around, around this very subject matter. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Um, should I show my own presentation, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay, so let me just see if I can share my screen. Give me one sec, please. Um, can you see my screen actually? 
Yeah, we can. Okay. So I just need yeah. to go full mode, but there we go. Can you still see it? It's, uh, it's coming up with a notes, but oh, hang on, that's the wrong one. Yeah, I just did apologize for that. Okay, so um, should work now, right, Chris? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So thank you very much for for hang, having me this on, on this call. I just want to um, give a quick introduction for those who are not familiar with our organization. WFSGI is the World Federation of Sporting Goods Industry. So we are um, an international body representing the sporting goods industry. Um, this includes brands like the Nike, Adidas, etc., but also manufacturers, um, mainly based in Asia. Then we have retailers like in Sport, Decathlon, Sport 2000, and the fourth group of member uh, members are the um, regional and national sporting goods federations. So, for example, in Europe, FESI, and then um, you have a national level as well, for example, in the US, SFIA, etc. So, we're representing those companies and um, one of the older projects that we have, uh, which is running over 10 years now, is our pledge that we do for the industry. And um, I think so looking into the presentations that we've seen so far um, this morning, we're now going a little bit more into the practical area. And this might be one example um, how you can look into compliance as an industry and how you can engage in the discussion and on a practical level actually do something. And we had some pre-discussions with Martin and our opinion is that uh, we can talk about sustainability, especially about, around the environmental, but if you come to the practical level, it goes hand in hand with social aspects as well, especially if you want to audit your supply chain. Um, social audits might be um, uh, an easier starting point because um, no matter what kind of product you're uh, producing, um, social questions are more or less the same across the industry. Whereas if you look into environmental issues, it really depends on the particular product. Are you using alloy? Are you using certain chemicals, etc.? So um, the pledge is also looking a little bit more on um, the social part, but it is applicable, of course, um, across the board to different um, um, aspects. So. To explain you a little bit more about our work here, and I'm not sure, Chris and Martin, how you want to handle it, if people have questions, if they should chip in, or if you want to take them at the end. Probably at we'll the take end. them yeah. at the end, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. okay. just because of time. Yeah. So um, the credits have to go to FIFA here. It's a, it's a rather um, unknown um, issue, but um, this was developed together with FIFA. And looking into the, the, the historical background, it all started um, around the 90s when child labor was um, an issue, especially in Pakistan and India in the football production. And there were quite some campaigns and media coverage about uh, the issues. And there was uh, reputational damage to the brand suppliers, retailers involved in the football uh, business. And it was also quite negative impact for FIFA as the world governing body for, for football. So this was actually the situation that prevailed in the 90s. And um, uh, based on this uh, problem, the industry together um, with some other organization um, like FIFA, but also the UN um, established the Atlanta Agreement. Um, and the Atlanta Agreement was basically um, an agreement to see how we can um, sort out the issue of child labor. And so in Pakistan, IMAC was founded. IMAC is the Independent Monitoring Association for Child Labor. And we had an India SGFI who took um, more or less kind of the same role to, to work with the, with, with the factories um, to avoid that kids are working there. And um, based on that agreement, we were looking into how can we practically uh, enroll a program to, to overcome that issue together with FIFA. And FIFA said, we have licenses producing football. So if you want to use a certain quality mark, FIFA inspected, FIFA approved, there are several of them. FIFA wants to make sure that these products are produced without child labor. So we, as the industry, we said, we're going to pledge for certain of the companies where our members we know, etc. And so this was where this strange term comes from, uh, pledge. And this was basically the starting idea. So at the beginning, it was just a paper we signed off for members. 
and we were just looking at uh, child labor and just at Pakistan and India. And then there was a whole development since then. Um, we say it in 2012, this is not of the state of the art any longer because um, there was a shift in global um, football production. Um, hand stitch football was no longer um, the big part of the football sold. So it started with machine stitching. And when the machine stitching came up, um, China, Thailand, and other countries um, became active and took a, a big chunk of, of um, the global volume. So we say it's not fair to focus on India and Pakistan, um, solely on those two uh, countries. And then we also had to recognize that the program had some first successes and child labor. I mean, you can never say you're, you're, you're waterproof or um, <laughs> or it's 100% um, it's given that there's no child labor any longer, but there were other issues coming up in the field of uh, sustainability. And so we say we, we should A, not focus only on those two countries and we should B, not focus only on child labor. So what we actually did, we took the entire WFSGI code of conduct, which is, um, I would say really robust um, state-of-the-art code of conduct, which is applicable for our members because they have to sign that code um, uh, off if they if they join the organization. So it means it's applicable on a global level across um, the industry, both brands, but also suppliers and retailers can, can use it. And our um, corporate responsibility committee is taking care on an ongoing basis to update that code um, if there are new developments. So we said we take that code um, together with FIFA and we say FIFA licenses have to comply with the entire code. So no longer looking just at child labor, but also working hours salaries, health and safety, etc. And we have also some environmental aspects. And this was this was a huge development. And um, over time, then, uh, even though FIFA started with footballs, they, they saw this as a decent solution. And they also included then artificial turf, goal line technology systems, EPTS, which is the electronic um, performance tracking systems, those chips that the, the players have in their shirts. So they, they, they include more and more products into that program um, today. And so that's the idea and the program behind it. And just looking really going down really on the practical level, what it all looks like uh, for um, a candidate FIFA licensee um, to, to go through that program. I will, I will quickly explain you what the procedure looks like. And again, you can apply that for whatever uh, you want. So um, the first thing is we have um, a guidance manual and agreement that the licensees have to sign where we really explain what um, they have to respect, um, et cetera. And it's also guidance which explains step-by-step step what they have to do. So um, we also explain what the purpose is, um, which parties are involved, how they have to submit papers, the liabilities, governing law, etc. That's the first thing. So it's, it's what they have to read, sign, and give us back so that we're sure they have seen that. And then we have act, that actual pledge form. And we need there the contact details of the FIFA licensee, but also of the factory where they produce. And if they're working with any trading companies, we want those information as well. So that we really knew. Um, where the product is coming from. And then there's our code and they have to sign up, uh, sign off this code that they respect that code. And it has to be signed um, by the factory and the licensee. And as you remember, I said at the beginning, this was the whole exercise. But what we do now is we also request an audit report on an annual basis. So even if a FIFA license might run over four years, there must be an audit report done on an annual basis. So it's not allowed to be older than one year and it has to cover all the provisions that we have um, in the WFSGI code of conduct. We're not requesting FIFA licensees to make an audit report specifically for that program if they're already enrolled in a multi-stakeholder initiative or anything like that. That's the work of our staff that they actually look to any existing audit reports which fulfills those requirements, which means the audit report is not older than one year and it covers our code. Whether this is a SMETA audit, um, an FLA audit, Fairway Foundation audit, uh, whatever you call them, we will check first um, if they cover everything and second, if the factory is compliant um, with at least the provisions of our code. And the audit has to be conducted by an independent third party auditing company so that it is completely independent and a quite new development. 
<coughs> excuse me, is that we say the auditing company has to be an active member of APSCA, which is a newly established um, global body, an association of professional social compliance auditors, and they have a kind of a threshold um, standard that companies have to meet. So with that requirement, we ensure that the, the auditing company is delivering a certain quality, has a certain experience, etc. And then the last point is the audit report has to be owned by the FIFA licensee. So we want to make sure um, that, uh, let's take a brand, Adidas is applying for the licensee. The audit report has to be owned by Adidas. They're not allowed to take an audit report from Nike or Puma, who is also producing in that factory, and provide that audit report. Because we want to create awareness, we want to make sure that they're responsible for that. And in case something is happening, it's of course, from a legal perspective, ridiculous if Adidas would have to rely on an audit from Puma. So this is the last requirement uh, with regard to, to the audit. And then if, if they fulfill all of that, and if we went through the audit report and we see that um, the production is in compliance, there's a certain service fee they have to pay. And then we have a letter of approval that goes to FIFA. And this looks like a quite old school, but it's, it's FIFA has developed an online system where we can log on and we can tick boxes, we can do everything online. So it's, uh, it's virtual, it's really quick. And only once we have made that pledge, FIFA will grant the license um, to the candidate company. So that's the very first step in the whole process for FIFA to accept the company as a licensee. If they don't comply with the code, they won't be a licensee. And also if um, the next year there might be some major issues that we can't work on with the licensee, FIFA has the right to cancel um, the license anytime if, if the uh, FIFA licensee has not a valid pledge from the WFSGI. So that's a little bit the process from a practical point of view. And um, it was new to us. Um, we've done that now over a decade, as I explained. We are now um, rolling out that program for, for World Rugby and other international sport organizations. And I would say the lessons we learned through, through that exercise is that it certainly helps to create awareness across a sector. So, I, I would say today, if you look to football manufacturers, they all know what compliance is, what social aspects are, what kind of standards are important because of that powerful development that was um, fostered by FIFA and where we really installed a program which made it, which created that awareness in the sector. And um, what we also have to recognize, what's really important, it's not a one-time exercise, it's a journey. So as I explained to you, we started somewhere really with a simple solution and we came to quite sophisticated level today with FIFA. But if we look into other sectors, it's maybe too ambitious to start on that level. You have to create awareness first in a sector. You have to make sure um, talking to the factories have they already been audited? Do they know what sustainability issues are? What's the local standard? Is there a certain level of compliance already? And if that's not a given, you might decide that you start on a lower level where you might not have such a high audit frequency because you first want to go into remediation actions, um, follow up audits and see that um, corrective uh, measures have been taken. So that's important to know um, that the whole story is a journey um, that you have to go through. And it, as I said, full compliance is not likely to be achieved from scratch. So if you go and audit first time factory, you will find non-compliances and that's something you have to be aware of. Um, but what we also think as an industry, inactivity is no longer an option. I mean, we've seen the presentation before from Russell, etc. And um, time is ripe to, to become active. And we also see it um, as an industry organization so that we have more and more people coming to us addressing such issues, being interested in, um, in such developments. We have the Center for Sports and Human Rights that was um, recently established where you have many of the um, sport governing bodies who are active in, which is looking into how you organize events, etc., and having a focus on sustainability. So we see that development going on and we think so it's time to address it. I was requested to, to, to pick, uh, to write down a few uh, possible next steps off the top of my head. And I, I think so it's important to look if you want to do, to address that as an industry, to exchange with the cricket governing bodies and see what is their interest 
um, is there a, a willingness, willingness to do something? And then maybe an assessment of the licensing systems that are in, in place. And is there any opportunity to include also some sustainable aspects, um, not uh, just uh, liability, insurance, quality, etc., but also um, some sustainable um, requirements. And then uh, uh, what we think is really important from an industry uh, perspective is that you thoroughly assess um, what kind of corporate responsibility programs are the licensees already having? Maybe they're already doing something. Maybe they already audit against code. So to understand what's already there, um, to define where you want to start off and to make sure that you respect um, the efforts and um, the, the resources that companies already put into that um, topic, into, into sustainability. And then, of course, you have to define the scope of a program, um, what you want to comply with, what are the important aspects. And what we think what is really crucial to make such um, a system success story is that you thoroughly brief the parties and you make sure that you create that awareness and um, that you roll out also an agreement and a plan, uh, which, which says we, we've done that with FIFA. They say, well, you have time to look into the issues during half a year. There will be the first audits in one year's time, etc. And we want you to fully comply within this time frame. So that's important and to, to clearly and transparently communicate that. Yeah, that would be my part um, so far, if that's OK. I hope I, uh, it wasn't too long. No, thanks, Mark. That, that was absolutely um, really, really riveting watching because I, I think that there is obviously a place for this um, within cricket, but obviously within wider sport as well. It's, um, yeah, it certainly helps to address those issues that you raise specifically around, you know, how you produce your goods sustainably and, you know, applying the right processes and principles to them. Um, Right, so thank you, Mark. And um, our next speaker then is Guido Battaglia, um, who is the Head of Policy and Outreach for the Center for Sports and Human Rights. Um, Guido, if you're okay, I'm sorry we've been running a bit late, um, but uh, I gather you've given us a little bit of extra of your time, so thank you. No, thank you, thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear me and let me just share my... Yep. Presentation. Okay, this is not the right. Okay, it's um, okay. okay. Should be working then. Yeah. Perfect. Good morning. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, also building on the other presentations from uh, other colleagues addressing social issues is fundamental to advancing the sustainable development goals. Um, efforts to maximize positive outcomes for people and planet have to be combined with efforts that contribute to the sustainable development goals in ways that also minimize negative impacts. Uh, this is uh, a point I wanted to, to make at the beginning and uh, uh, some of the points I will be uh, raising during my presentation also build on uh, uh, in particular what Russell and Mark uh, previously presented. So topics I will address today. Um, my brief presentation will focus on uh, three aspects. Uh, first of all, um, human rights impacts occurring in sports and also a specific focus on supply chain impact. Um, then I would like to share information on the internationally recognized framework that helps all industries address human rights issues in the supply chain. And last, uh, building also on uh, previous comments, I will uh, just brief, briefly share some information on the work we're doing as the Center uh, for Sport and Human Rights and how this work can help actors in uh, the sporting goods industry and uh, working in the, with the sport of cricket um, address some of the issues I will be bringing. So let's start with human rights impacts occurring in sport. Uh, first of all, I would like to share with you um, an ecosystem map 
of the world of sport uh, from a human rights perspective. This is uh, an exercise that uh, we're acting here uh, at the Center for Sport and Human Rights. Uh, you see that at the core of the map, uh, there are no institutions, uh, but people. You see athletes, journalists, fans, uh, volunteers, workers, uh, particular migrant workers and other workers involved in supply chain, you know, listed really included at the core of this map. And all of them can benefit from sport. We are all aware of uh, the benefit impacts and uh, the positive impacts that sports like cricket may, may have on people. But like any other industry, sport may also have negative impacts. And if you look um, at the outside part of this uh, graph, you will see uh, institutions and organizations that uh, throughout their activities may have impacts on uh, these people. You see, of course, international federations, major event owners, professional sport bodies, uh, event organizers, host governments, uh, everybody plays a role. Uh, very important for this discussion, clearly, is business. And business can be involved in sport as a sponsor. Uh, we can think about uh, broadcasters as well, uh, are directly working with, uh, for example, the sport cricket as commercial partners. And then of course there are suppliers and uh, those who are providing uh, uh, sporting goods uh, like uh, those that Mark mentioned beforehand. So this is, this is an effort to map the world of sport to combine why uh, this discussion uh, uh, is relevant and uh, why and where does this uh, cricket and clothing uh, discussion fits with what I'm going to share afterward. So here you can find a list of examples of negative impacts in the world of sport. Uh, you can see that athletes, uh, communities, journalists, uh, workers, uh, female athletes, and other affected groups are those who may be victims of human rights abuses in sport. And supply chain issues, uh, like, uh, for example, issues in construction or in the apparel sector, are clearly part of this list. And we have seen issues rising in Qatar and in many other uh, places where uh, major sport events will take place. And uh, um, this is of course something relevant for the International uh, uh, Cricket World Cup or any other uh, cricket related uh, event. So we can deep dive on specific human rights risks in a complex uh, global supply chain. Uh, human rights and labor abuses may take place in complex global supply chain uh, for sporting goods, uh, merchandise, uniforms, medals, and beyond. Uh, goods and services like clothing, electronics, foods, and construction materials, they're often sourced from suppliers and subcontractors in the low, lowest cost countries, often in countries where governments are either unable or unwilling basically to enforce uh, basic standards and where abuses in production processes may include, for example, forced labor, illegal child labor, serious health and safety breaches, low or unpaid wages, discrimination, union intimidation and the denial of freedom of association and collective bargaining. Uh, these supply chains can involve several hundred primary relationships and several thousand suppliers beneath their initial tier, spanning a very diverse range of industries. Is it a company's duty or responsibility to fix everything wrong in a country? Understanding companies' responsibility can be very hard without a framework to help them navigate their way. And this is the reason why I wanted to share a couple of words on the internationally recognized standards that may help companies, but also sport organizations um, identify their specific responsibilities when it comes to, uh, to, to, to human rights. The UN guiding principles on business and human rights are the global standard for preventing and addressing the risk of adverse impacts on human rights linked to business activity. And they provide the internationally accepted framework for enhancing standards and practices with regard to business and human rights. So 
what do these principles say? First of all, they were unanimously approved by the Human Rights Council in 2011. They reference many other standards that are essential for business, like the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises, the ILO declaration on fundamental principles and rights at work, and of course, the International Bill of Human Rights. They played a key role to help advance the discussion from who is responsible for what to how can we implement and how can we take actions to address some of these issues. And they do so uh, basically uh, by identifying three key pillars, which define the role of each relevant stakeholder. Pillar one is about governments and is about their duty to protect human rights. Uh, governments have the duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business, and they have to do so, you know, by, of course, enforcing laws and standards. Then it comes to business and their responsibility to respect human rights, the responsibility to avoid violating human rights wherever and however they operate. And the third pillar is about access to effective remedy. And it is about make things right. Uh, when uh, uh, someone, someone's rights are impacted, um, what is the solution and how can this be fixed? And both governments and business play a role there. When it comes to the responsibility for business to respect human rights, it's important to, to flag that uh, uh, unlike, you know, um, when it comes to the environmental sector where you know, negative impacts can be offset. The problem with human rights is that uh, the commitment should be a commitment to respecting all internationally recognized human rights. And uh, uh, this, of course, uh, increases the responsibility uh, of business and also uh, brings an additional responsibility that goes beyond a more common corporate social responsibility perspective where you may say, uh, we can dig a well, we can build a school, and then we're doing our job there. Uh, actually, the job for business that is operating in uh, different areas and different sector is mainly not to cause, contribute, or be linked to negative human rights. How can companies, in particular, uh, sport organization, basically, uh, take action to make sure that uh, uh, they know and they show what it means to respect human rights. Uh, first of all, the first step is about commitment. It's about stating in main documents, uh, statutes, that they are committing to respecting all internationally recognized human rights. And it will be needed also to uh, outline in these main documents uh, what are the steps and how you're planning to do that. Uh, second, second point, assessing risk of adverse human rights impact. And this is about assessing not only the risks to business, which is something that business is uh, uh, used to do, but it's about assessing the potential risk to people and what are the main risks that uh, their activities may uh, be linked to and also how can they manage to address uh, these risks at stake. As I mentioned before, Anne, uh, one company, you know, may directly cause a human rights impact, and it may be an example of a company that uh, discriminates uh, when it comes to wages between men and women. But in many other instances, a company uh, may be involved as a contributor to human rights impact. And one example may be a company that strongly recommends to use security forces in one place or next to one factory that have a negative human rights track. But more often, and this is uh, clearly the case when it comes to supply chain issues, uh, companies may be linked to human rights abuse. This means that uh, abuses may take place at the second or third or fourth level uh, or tier uh, of distance between their activity and uh, uh, the business relationships they have with, their, um, with, with the companies that are directly involved. And this, of course, uh, generates challenges because uh, uh, the further you go in the supply chain, uh, the more difficult it is to identify, uh, the, not only to identify the impacts, but also to identify how you're linked to this and what you can do to uh, minimize these, uh, these impacts. Of course, once you have mapped 
the potential impacts you may have, starting in particular with the salient ones. It is important to integrate human rights into policies, procedures, and responsibilities, uh, which means that really uh, you need to have the right systems in place uh, in your governance structure to address these issues. Tracking, very important. You can only uh, measure uh, success of only of what you, um, only if you have the right information and the data available. And then of course, uh, communication. Uh, you need to be in a position to know and show that you are conscious of the human rights risks at stake. And uh, you have to be transparent basically about what is happening, acknowledge gaps, acknowledge issues at stake and uh, constructively engage with all stakeholders to seek to identify a uh, solution to these issues. Uh, last point, connected with the remedy point that I mentioned beforehand, make it right. When harm happens, where it is a, uh, clear that there is a connection between your activity and the negative impact, and this will happen. It happens throughout the whole um, spectrum of, uh, of, of industries in this world, uh, be ready to uh, um, make sure that you can put action in place to uh, make it right. So it is a complex process. It is in, indeed, indeed very, very difficult to as, not only to assess responsibilities within the uh, supply chain, but it is also extremely uh, complex to affect change when these impacts happen at a level that, that is far from your direct activities. This is not a reason. Uh, for business to disengage. Actually, this is a reason for business to exert its leverage in the best way it can. And uh, efforts, international collective efforts, uh, have proved to be, to, be, to be helpful to advance on this topic. We're conscious of uh, many multi-stakeholder initiatives that uh, take place at the pre-competitive level that help the industry advance on, uh, uh, on this issue. The Center for Sport and Human Rights uh, when it comes to human rights abuses in the world of sport is uh, an entity that can help uh, together industry representatives advance on, the issue, on these issues. As I mentioned beforehand, dialogue is key. And the center offers a platform for meaningful stakeholder engagement on these issues by bringing together governments, companies, sponsors, broadcasters, affected groups and their representatives, very important. And also industry associations like the World Federation for the Sporting Good Industry. We address these issues in the context of mega sporting events, in the context of child rights abuse in sport, in the context of uh, access to remedy. And what we do together is that we develop tools and guides to help sport bodies, local organizing committees, sponsors and broadcasters understand how to embed human rights into their operations and respond responsibly to crises they may face. We are the platform where inclusive multi-stakeholder discussion can take place. We organize events, uh, podcasts, webinars, and we convene regular working groups to address human rights issues and to identify practical solution in compliance with internationally recognized human rights standards. If you would like to hear more about our work, I'm looking forward to engaging with you. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope that it was informative. It resonates with the context of uh, cricket and sporting goods. And I would really like to thank you again for the opportunity and for your attention. Guido, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, clearly you know, the moral conscience of, um, of sport. And uh, actually, it kind of provides a, a nice reality check, you know, for the kind of passion that sits behind sport. And, you know, when obviously any of us are in a stadium supporting team, country, whatever it is, we perhaps don't always, or I would say most of the time, don't have that kind of insight into what sits behind it. And certainly compromising human rights shouldn't be part of delivering whatever you know, element of sport it is. So thank you for that. Um, are, are you going to be able to stay for a little while, Guido? To... I, I have a hard stop at half past, but I would really love to, okay, to, to, to so... answer any question or 
keep yeah, contributing but, to the discussion. Brilliant. Okay, so, so we're going to move to the panel um, part of the program, which is going to be facilitated by Martin Charter. So Guido, you'll have a replacement. Uh, Neil McPhee will step in when you leave. Um, so if it would be Russell Seymour, Marky Bar, Guido, and Andrew Martin, who is the Vice President for the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, will be on the panel and we'll fire questions. We'll, we'll take some out of the chat. There's been some really good conversation in the chat, and so we can probably pick up some of those questions there. Over to you, Martin. Okay, thanks, Chris, and thank, thank all uh, the speakers. And I think uh, for the chat, for the questions, short, precise, Questions uh, are great that uh, uh, we can sort of pick up there. So, um, so you know, in, in summary, in, in this event, you know, we're we're looking, you know, at the primarily the issues around the equipment, uh, the clothing and apparel, but clearly that big context, the big issues, you know, uh, that that Russ has brought out, you know, clearly have a a direct relationship and. And what I got out of the conversation uh, was uh, that this area, in terms of the equipment, et cetera, has not been really looked at in great detail, particularly the social dimension. I think uh, Russ's presentation really brought in that much bigger perspective in terms of climate change and the fact it's now, now here, the Joe uh, Root example, but also that link to uh, the health dimension is very clear within the social context. Um, I think Mike I, Iver then brought in that broader uh, experience over sort of nearly 10 years of, of FIFA working out the football uh, in the, the football sector and some of the, the issues that manufacturers now are, are tackling in their supply chains. And then Guida really focused in some of those more specific issues around the human and, and human, uh, the social and human rights side. I personally see us in a, in a fifth green consumer wave now where we're starting to see, uh, you know, issues morphing and changing and, and more questions emerging. Some of it's coming full circle. Uh, I'd say, you know, the, the, the first wave was the 60s, second wave uh, was the late 80s, around the time of, of with Russ's point there of the, uh, you know, the Brundtland uh, Commission in 1987, you know, Mrs. Thatcher finding the hole in the ozone layer, the Green Consumer Guide, and then just after that, the first uh, Earth Summit in 92. So that was a sort of second big wave. The third wave, in my opinion, was in the 2000s, when climate change got a lot more visibility, you know, there's a lot of questions around what is your personal carbon footprint. A lot of companies really focusing overtly on low carbon energy efficiency. But I uh, perhaps saw prior to the lockdown in this emergence of a new um, wave driven by youth, and that was different. So youth around climate change, particularly, and the, the power of youth uh, to use social media, to uh, you know, spread the message. And I think during the pandemic, that sort of morphed further, in my opinion, where the human health dimensions come into it and biodiversity and nature. So I think the social element and the nature element, you know, uh, you know which chimes very closely with a lot of uh, some of the conversations. So I'd like to just start off by you know, asking the panelists, uh, and I'll start with Guido because Guido's on a time, uh, uh, you know, uh, constraint. Is from what you've heard today, and, and I and I and I appreciate you're not a <laughs> cricket is a new game uh, uh, for you. Um, but what what would you say from what you've heard today, and, and your, your own thoughts? What would you say you would perceive to be maybe the the biggest challenge that maybe the sector will face, and, and maybe any opportunities that you, you might think. Thank you, Martin. Uh, also, we heard from uh, from Mark and this presentation connected with uh, the FIFA uh, experience. My my first reaction to to your question, Martin, is that supply chain issues are common uh, not only not only to sports but also to uh, to, to many industries. 
So I believe that there are opportunities to um, adopt similar ap approach or for example that, uh, that Mark shared beforehand is something that can, uh, can, can be of course applied to, uh, to the context of, uh, of cricket. When it comes to cricket also, uh, there are also geopolitical uh, perhaps considerations that, uh, that, uh, that, that are relevant. But I will say that when it comes to, to, to human rights, I see a common pattern for all sports you know, to, uh, to, 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 follow, to, to follow the UNGPs and uh, uh, to collaborate with the parallel sector, you know, to advance uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on these issues. I think that, uh, yeah, also because of uh, the popularity of, uh, of cricket in certain areas of the world, uh, clearly some, some aspects may be more relevant than others, but this is also uh, linked to the need to conduct human rights due diligence and to really understand the major risks at stake. And this uh, can be uh, done uh, through stakeholder engagement with affected groups. And this will be an exercise that can provide more insights on uh, where should we start from when it comes to, to cricket. And, and just a, a quick follow-up on that is bearing in mind um, a lot of the supply chain, it appears, is in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, there it goes back to Russell's point in terms of sustainable development definition that needs, you know, the issues may well be slightly different in different countries as, as, as such. So do you have examples or any example, one, which is great, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, maybe a Western company, you know, uh, working with you know, other stakeholder groups in, in say, India or Pakistan, you know, and, and it, you, any example there in any sort of issues or, or what would you see with that sort of perspective? Yes, yes. Um, there, is, there, there is one effort that is conducted on a yearly basis, which is called the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark. And I'm happy to share the link with you, uh, which is an effort conducted by the World Benchmarking Alliance that uh, is uh, um, benchmarking the efforts conducted by various industry sectors uh, when it comes to human rights and their commitments. Uh, many uh, companies that are uh, also very active in that, that area of the region are ranked and uh, benchmarked against this, uh, against this mm, human rights criteria. And uh, we can see that uh, companies like Adidas or uh, others um, performed, uh, performed pretty well although uh, clearly there is a uh, margin for uh, improvement uh, for everyone. I am happy to share with you the link uh, to this corporate human that, rights benchmark, Martin. That, that, would, that would be great. And uh, we, 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 we tried to invite some of the larger transnational players to the workshops, uh, the workshop, or we, we didn't try, we did, uh, but uh, perhaps they're uh, awaiting the, the, the outcome of the workshop to, to engage hopefully in the future. So. Uh, and, and again, just to reinforce uh, what Chris said at the beginning, we'll, we'll produce a short brief briefing document after this event that we'll be happy to share. So, so maybe I'll go to now to, to Russ. Um, similar sort of uh, question, you know, from you know some who's been involved around the issues for a long time, you know, from various perspectives. What would you see thinking about that equipment side? Um, you know, one or two of the biggest challenges and maybe some of the opportunities that you might see emerging as, as we, we go forward. Yeah, um, thanks, Martin. Um, I, I think the biggest issues we need to address are the issues that are happening now in terms of, of production. Um, and there's an old uh, uh, adage or whatever, an old, old phrase around um, when is the best time to plant a tree? Obviously, trees are relevant to what we're talking about in terms of bats, but this is, you know, in, in terms of a general principle, when's the best time to plant a tree? It was 30 years ago. So that's when we should have been taking action. The second best time to plant a tree is now. So we've got impacts happening across the board. You know, sports apparel, sports clothing, sports equipment is, is a microcosm of all of the other manufacturing that is going on. So, you know, we're not alone in terms of starting to think about these issues. It's just that maybe, arguably, we've got a a good platform in terms of sport to actually start saying why we're talking about these issues, um, what the benefits will be moving forward um, and, and spread those a bit more generally. I think the the heat issue that I talked about uh, 
a, a, a reasonable amount, is probably the one that's closest to um, individual players in terms of individual player safety. Uh, it's the one where we seem to be having this increasing trend in 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 higher heat. Even in England, we're getting these hotter days where where not just players but fans are being impacted. So that's a very direct impact. I think the other issues around climate change tend to affect cricket and other sports in less direct ways. Um, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of flooding, storm damage, those kind of things, it affects the infrastructure rather than what we're specifically talking about in terms of, of clothing and apparel. So I think it's it's engaging with current manufacturing and what we're doing and trying to make sure that our supply chains um, from both the social perspective that we've heard very well from from Guido um, but from an environmental perspective are actually functioning much better and then that that does is going to need engagement with ICC with national governing bodies as well around the playing regulations and maybe looking at the standards reviewing some of the British standards I know British standards do have a strong uh desire to include sustainability across all of their standards so is there a way of inserting this in there somehow um so yeah it, it's all about engagement what we're doing now um but i think moving forward linking the issues to player safety is probably the the surest way of making change um but there are other issues that, that need to come in there as well so there's something there about action, engagement, and linking it to the sort of real issues that players deal with, you know, because they're operating in the environment per se, you know, so um, so that, that's great. And I, I know there is a number of questions emerging. I see Daryl and there was some other question, but we'll, we'll just pick up with the panelists first and then uh, we'll pick up those other questions. So you're not forgotten. Uh, so, so maybe Mike, Mark, Ivor, the same sort of uh, point from what, what you've heard today, again, as a as a newbie to cricket, uh, what, 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 you know, but, but involved in a lot of uh, different sectors where I'm sure you're seeing parallel issues. Uh, what, what are so, some of your observations on the, the sort of challenge and any opportunities? Think muted, muted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think so it's important coming from the industry. I, I'm not sure who the audience is, but if, if we have brands on the call, if we have manufacturers on the call, it's all nice to hear that there's time for action, etc. But the question is always, how do you translate that into into practical action? You know, how how can you be a game changer? And it's quite important because this is not part of, of most of those kind of discussions. How can you become active as a company? And there, it's just a call out to all the companies if you can work together. Um, most of those topics are of non-competitive nature. If you share suppliers, you won't be able to change anything if you're not doing that with the other brands who are using that supplier as well. Um, it makes no sense if the supplier is just applying certain standards just for the part he is producing for you. That's not practically implementable. You have, you have to change everything. And so it's really important to work together, even though you're not doing that normally as competitors, this is a non-competitive area. You will save um, resources, um, also money if you if you do that together. And the chances of success are much larger if you if you if you move ahead as an industry as a group. If you take on board manufacturers and you say, hey, this is a topic we have to tackle together. We're sitting all in the same boat. So seeing SAC on on the call, they, they are working together with that parallel industry where you have competitors like H&M, Zara, but Nike, Adidas, et cetera, who are joining to take up such discussions. And I think so that's important as well for the cricket industry. Now, we are aware that if it comes to hard goods like the bats, et cetera, there are no such organizations. We have set up the responsible sport initiative for the bike industry where they're jointly auditing their supply chain. So this is something we're happy to share as well. But it's really from a practical point, if you um, break those barriers and try to sit together and see that you get that neutral platform to discuss such issues and the chances of success are, are much broader. And that's just something, a giveaway if people are going back then and say, okay, where should we start? What should we do? So maybe just use such calls, such um, opportunities to see who is also interested to move yeah. ahead.